Hey everybody, welcome back to another lecture video, this one on chapter 25, uh, or 15 if you're going by the numbering of the current edition book. Um, nucleotides, nucleic acids, and heredity. So what we're going to look at is the precursor to how those proteins got made that we were looking at in the last couple of chapters. We're going to take a, uh, like proteins in general, I mean, um, we're going to look at how proteins get made in the next chapter. But in this one, we're going to look at how the information for that pro for those proteins is stored. Um, so let's just dive right in. So it um, was uh, pondered in the uh, in in the early days of chemistry, and in uh, the early days of any kind of biological studying, um, where all the proteins came from. Um, and so they thought that the proteins were encoded. That 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 was a belief, um, and they knew that it must have been something that could be passed down. Um, and so they were looking in the cell, you know, with microscopes and stuff, they were able to kind of figure out where in the cell they thought this was happening. And the, the main structure that looked like it was the, the, the suspect was the chromosomes. Now, the chromosomes are a secondary or maybe even a tertiary structure of DNA. So we're going to have to look at DNA's primary structure first. Um, but essentially, chromosomes are our structures. Um, you know, not all organisms have chromosomes, so, so like bacteria don't. Uh, but our chromosomes are tightly packed. We have something like 23 pairs or something like that. Um, and they contain all the gene genetic information we got from our parents. The genes are those genetic information. So the genes are the proteins or the, the information that codes for the proteins. Um, and we've also seen that in our bodies, for example, or in eukaryotes in general, um, our chromosomes, um, which are made mainly of nucleic acids, um, are also associated with certain proteins called histones. And we don't see that across the, you know, the biological spectrum. Bacteria, for example, don't have histones uh, with their DNA. Okay, so we knew the chromosomes were important. And analysis of the chromosomes um, gave us information about what they were made from. And that was deoxyribonucleic acids, or for short, DNA. Um, and so we learned that DNA has the information that encodes for all of our proteins. Now, there's two kinds of nucleic acids. There's nucleic acids that come in the deoxyribonucleic acid form, um, but there's also the ribonucleic acid form. And we'll look at the structure. All we'll see is that the DNA is missing an oxygen where the RNA molecules are not. But that's the main difference is... Um, in the sugar molecule, we're going to have a missing oxygen. RNA and DNA, though, however, play different roles in our bodies. DNA is the main uh, genetic information, the main storage of uh, our, our genes, our genome. RNA act as uh, intermediates, and we'll look at all the jobs that RNA do um, in the later chapter or the next chapter. A nucleotide is composed of three parts. You can kind of remember that. Uh, with the T here and the, you know, three. Uh, I mention that because there's something called a nucleoside, um, which is just these two things. Uh, and the nucleotide is all three things. Uh, a base, we're going to look at nitrogenous bases, purines and pyrimidines. We're going to look at a monosaccharide. This is the ribose, the sugar. Let's put purine pyrimidine, um, and a phosphate group. And so these are the five uh, unique bases. Um, there are two purines, adenine and guanine. These are the nitrogenous bases that we're looking at here. Two purines. There are three pyrimidines, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Um, adenine, guanine, and cytosine are in RNA and DNA. In RNA only, we get uracil, and in DNA only, we get thymine. So there is, uh, uh, that's how we know really when we're looking at RNA versus DNA, is we can tell if, if there's a presence or absence of those nucleotides. I mentioned the nucleoside is the two parts. This is the nitrogenous base paired with a ribose sugar. Um, these are D-riboses. Um, and here, we're going to look at the number two position on the sugar, uh, 
And if there's an oxygen there, then this is um, ribo, or, or, or riboside, or a ribose sugar. And if it's uh, missing an, H, an, an O, then it's a deoxyribose. Um, so again, depending on which one it is. So here we're looking at deribose. Deoxyribose would be missing that O. But that's the difference between RNA and DNA. Here we're just looking at what a nucleoside is. Now, when we add a phosphate group, we get a nucleotide. Um, the phosphates come from um, uh, those, those enzymes called kinases that actually transfer phosphate groups to molecules. Um, it's not clear here where the phosphates are coming from. They're coming from some source. But once these guys get phosphates um, on them, or phos the, the three phospho groups on them, um, they can change what we call them, the designation. So when they have one phosphate, we give it the monophosphate. Uh, when it's got two phosphates, it gets diphosphate, and three phosphates will get triphosphate. And then depending on which base it is, is the first letter. So this is an adenine. So that's why all of these start with a, an A. This is adenine, uh, as a nucleotide, is called adenosine. This would be adenosine monophosphate, adenosine diphosphate, adenosine triphosphate. We can do GMP, GDP, GTP, and so on Oops, for all of the um, nucleotides. In case you're, you're making the connection, ATP is that high energy molecule that we use um, in our cells. Okay, so this is um, the DNA version. So it's missing the O. And this is a nucleotide because it has the phosphate group on it. Uh, the phosphate group is important. We're going to see that as we start to link um, different nucleotides together, um, we're going to basically bring in another another sugar that's going to have a five prime end and it's also going to have down here a three prime phosphate and then of course all the other stuff this is the base and it's going to be a reaction between the three prime and the five prime side to form a phosphodiester bond um, we'll take a look at that so it's going to be called a phosphodiester bond because here this is an ester. And we know what happens from previous um, chapters when an anhydride reacts with an alcohol. Um, and the alcohol group is going to be on the, the incoming carbon. I mean, I'm sorry, the incoming nucleotide. All right, so here we're going to talk about linking them together. So primary structure is the sequence of nucleotides, just like primary structure in a protein was the sequence of amino acids. Um, where in amino acids we read from the N side to the C side, in DNA we read from the 5 side to the 3 prime side. Um, and so if we were looking at a sequence AGT, we would assume that to mean, let's see if I can kind of draw it, if these were the bases, these would each be attached to sugars. Probably don't have to draw this for you. Uh, and then the phosphates are going to be, let's see. Let's just call that a phosphate. The, we're going to assume this to mean that the five prime side is the free side on our first nucleotide. And that over here we'll have a three prime side that's our last nucleotide. So again, we're reading it this direction, A, G, T. DNA is always read that way. M, uh, mRNA and RNA are also read that way as well. So this is um, just a primary uh, structure of DNA. We know it's DNA because it has thymine and not uracil. Um, you'll notice that it's got a, f a sugar phosphate backbone. So that's the backbone, unlike in amino acids, the NCC, NCC. This time it's the sugar phosphate and the bases are kind of like the R groups in our proteins. They're the thing that sticks out. All right, so that's a strand of DNA.
Now, as far as secondary structures go, our DNA is arranged in something called a double helix. So the, the nucleotides are actually paired up, complementary paired, with another strand of nucleotides. And then these guys are um, kind of wound around each other in a, like it says here, a screw-like fashion. So let's take a look. So you can see it here. Uh, we've got the du double helix, complementary strand. Notice that um, all the G's and C's pair up, all the A's and T's pair up. Um, as far as secondary structures go in this double helix, you can see a few um, little notables. Um, we've got a major groove and we've got a minor groove. The minor groove is this sort of little indentation. Major groove is a bigger indentation. Um, this becomes important with um, proteins that bind on DNA. They can bind to certain positions, whether it's the minor groove or the major groove. Um, the major groove gives more access to the insides in here, so you can actually get at the nucleotide information better than at the minor groove. Um, so variations in that structure um, play out in terms of um, replication and whatnot. Let's talk about the base pairing. So I mentioned thymine uh, uh, T and adenine A pair up, and G and C pair up. Well, here's why. Um, their structures allow for a certain hydrogen bonding. So in thymine and adenine between this um, pyrimidine and this purine, you see we get hydrogen bonding between this nitrogen's hydrogen and this oxygen, and this nitrogen's hydrogen, and this nitrogen over here. With C and G, we get three hydrogen bonds. So the GC bonds are actually stronger than the AT bonds because there's an extra bond, an extra hydrogen bond. So um, it's actually harder to pull apart the DNA strands if they have more GC in them. And that has implications for beyond um, our, our purposes here today. We'll talk about more of that in the next chapter. As far as our superstructures, uh, the chromosomes, that happens when our DNA, that, which is the double helix, gets wound around pro proteins called histones. Um, histones ultimately end up having a lot of positive charge on them. DNA, with that phosphate backbone, has a lot of negative charge on it, and so um, they pair up together really nicely. Uh, a nucleosome is what we call eight histones wrapped around the DNA to make a little core. I'll kind of show it to you. Looks like... Oh, that was a really bad drawing. It's like if this was cut like this, and so there's eight sections, right? There's one section and then two section, right? Four, and then another four behind it. Sorry about that. Um, and then the DNA is all wound in there and around it. So if we had like a cylinder with all those different proteins, and then the DNA is kind of like all wrapped around it, um, so those are nucleosomes. Nucleosomes condense into chromatin, which further condenses into chromosomes. So that's the uh, secondary and superstructures of our DNA. And here you can kind of see a, a more realistic looking picture. So our double helix uh, with the actual size of it there. Nucleosome here, the histone proteins are on the inside. DNA is wound around the outside. Here you can see what chromatin looks like. So imagine these are those histones with all their complexes, their eight complexes. And then um, these are the beads on a string, right? It looks like the DNA. Um, this, this is interesting too, because when different parts of the DNA need to be replicated, these little chromatins kind of shift around like the strand unwinds. It kind of you know moves so that different parts of the DNA become available. And then we have the solenoid structure. So all of these little beads on a string sort of cause another little kind of windy helix. And then ultimately, um, chromosomes are really looped structures. And we know our chromosomes, you know, when we end up looking kind of like, you know, these little X-shaped things. If you've ever um, isolated chromosomes and kind of looked at them under a microscope. There we go. So again, you can see here um, the size difference, right? Two nanometers for just a strand of DNA.
chromosomes and stacked mini bands. Okay, so um, our DNA is, is arranged like this in bacteria, which are just, you know, little rod shaped or circular shaped organisms. They have a circular bit of DNA. Um, but rather than show it as just a circle or a circular like that, um, you can imagine that it's just kind of like loose spaghetti everywhere in the cell. It doesn't actually condense into any kind of structures like ours. All right, so we've got the differences between DNA and RNA, mainly um, the presence of T in the um, DNA and uracil in the RNA. Uh, the difference in the sugar, DNA has uh, missing oxygen. Um, and then DNA is always double-stranded where RNA is single-stranded. That is something that uh, we haven't talked about yet. So double-stranded DNA, double helix, RNA, single strands. I think we're going to take a look at more of the in-depth uh, RNAs in the uh, next chapter. So the way that DNA actually encodes the information, which we'll go in in the next chapter as well, um, is through this process. So first, DNA needs to be able to be copied. Um, <clears throat> all the information from one cell needs to get into the other cell. So DNA goes through replication. And we'll talk about DNA replication um, in a little more detail. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the gist of it is that the entire complement of DNA gets replicated and one parent molecule gives rise to two what we call daughter molecules. Um, so that's just replication, making sure every cell has the ge genetic information it needs. Now, making proteins is a different process. That involves first transcription. That means taking the information in the DNA and making something called mRNA. Now, messenger RNA is the intermediary that takes that information from the DNA and makes a protein from it. Now, that is our first sort of um, look at an, an RNA molecule. Now, there's also translation, which is the next step. It's taking that mRNA and actually turning it into a peptide. Uh, or a protein. Now that involves two more types of RNA. We get rRNA in terms of the ribosome and we have tRNAs that are responsible for bringing in the amino acids. So transcription and translation are those protein processes. All right, so here are the different types of RNAs. I mentioned transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, and messenger RNA. Those are involved in the protein synthesis. What we didn't talk about were small nuclear RNAs and microRNAs, which are found in, in our bodies. Um, microRNAs um, have something to do with which genes get expressed. Small interfering RNAs actually um, can be used, or it's like a body's, our body's protective uh, mechanism against foreign DNA. It kind of goes and knocks out um, genes um, that maybe shouldn't be transcribed, and we can talk about that later. Um, the small nuclear RNAs have a role in processing our pre-mRNA into an mRNA form that can be uh, made into proteins. Um, and again, these small interfering RNAs, um, most of the RNAs floating around in our bodies are actually small interfering RNAs. And these just go and bind to DNA. And they can bind to DNA or to other RNAs. Um, and actually stop the, the, the translation process. All right, so this is tRNA. One of these is called the cloverleaf form. You could probably guess which one. It's the one on the left. And then the L-shaped form is the one on the right. What you can see here about these amino acid, um, I'm sorry, these um, tRNAs, is that they are single-stranded. In this one, you can really see that. Um, there is a secondary structure because of internal hydrogen bonding, and we get these neat little cloverleaf structures. Now, um, there's a couple of main regions here. One is what we call the anticodon loop. This is going to recognize the genetic code and actually um, read that mRNA to bring in the right amino acid. Now, this tRNA's job is to bring in the right amino acid, and so there's a spot for the amino acid to bind. Uh, and there's also a few other regions that are important for an enzyme called synthetase, uh, tRNA synthetase, and it's the molecule that puts the tRNA and the RNA, um, the amino acid together. And every tRNA is specific for one amino acid, and that enzyme is is that job of that enzyme is to make sure the right one gets put on there. And so there's some other, some other recognition sites, um, the green and orange here that are important in this structure. Um, here is a ribosome. A ribosome is rRNA. 
Now, our RNA is also um, involved in uh, protein synthesis. This, this is where the protein synthesis happens. So the ribosome's job, and usually there are a few different subunits and a lot of proteins involved, um, but this is mostly RNA um, that's folded you know, back on itself to, to kind of be a, a catalyst here. mRNA is going to associate with the ribosome. And let's just say these are a bunch of different codes, a bunch of letters, A, U, U, G, C, you know, U, and so on. Um, the ribosome is going to sit on the mRNA and read it. And tRNAs are going to bring in amino acids. The little tRNAs are going to bring in amino acids, and a growing peptide is going to come out of this ribosome. So that's what their job is. And we'll talk about some of the details uh, later. Um, some of the subunits. Um, these two add together to make the 70S subunit. So these, this is not math here. Um, these designations come from um, centrifuging and, and high-speed centrifugation and something to do with how they settle out. So don't, don't try to add those up. Um, again, the, the point here is to just show that the ribosome is composed of not just RNA, but um, lots of proteins as well, and that there are multiple subunits. A little bit of a, a, some, a synopsis of the types of RNAs and um, what they do. Now let's talk about um, the, those actual sections of the DNA that we want to make into proteins. Now those are called genes. So the gene is the code that dictates the sequence of amino acids, ultimately that leads to a protein. Um, in ours, we have something called introns uh, that are inserted into our genes. Um, the parts of our gene that we want are called exons, and we have these little bits called introns. Um, and so we have to cut those out. In bacteria, that's not a problem. Um, they don't have introns. We also have something called uh, regulatory genes. We have um, operons, and, and uh, there's some other names for them. But essentially, we have parts of our DNA that regulate when the genes are turned on and off, um, and then we have genes, and so our, our DNA is more complicated. In bacteria, the, the genes are just lined up after each other, and usually they just, uh, there's not a lot of, I mean, there is regulation, but um, it's, it's just a little simpler. Um, our genes are separated by stretches of non-coding information. In bacteria, the genes are just stacked up uh, right behind each other. Let's take a look. So here is a typical gene. This is in bacteria. Um, so here we have gene A, gene B, gene C. Each one of these would code for a different protein. And so um, the DNA would make RNA. Now the RNA um, would be read by the ribosome. And here's a ribosome, this little guy right here. And as the ribosome is running along the portion that is the portion of gene A, it's making protein A. And then as it's getting through the part that is, you know, of the mRNA that's gene B, it makes protein B. Now, we don't do that. Our mRNAs would stop right after the first gene, and then we would have a separate mRNA for the second gene, okay? Now, the thing that's making the mRNA is something called RNA polymerase. Now, we didn't talk about um, the other types of polymerases. I think we may have talked about DNA polymerase um, previously. DNA polymerase is what replicates DNA. RNA polymerase is what makes RNA, and it makes it from DNA. So that's why we see this mRNA molecule coming out of this RNA polymerase. All right, here's a look at our genes. Now ours are a little more complicated. So our DNA has coding portions called exons, and then non-coding portions called introns that get put into the mRNA. So this is the mRNA right here. Um, so the intron is still in here. We need to get it spliced out. And so um, those um, small nuclear um, RNAs, or um, I guess uh, RNPs, as they're calling them here too, um, help with that process. Now, one of the other things that happens to our mRNA is that it has to get modified. We have to get um, uh, this polyadenylene, poly-A tail added to it, and a 5' prime cap added to this side for protecting uh, degradation from the back side and unwanted reactions on the front side. Um, and so our pre-mRNA 
spliced mRNA, now mature mRNA, um, is ready for um, translation. And so a ribosome then would come and associate with this, go that way, and then make a protein. So a little, little more complicated than in the prokaryotes. Um, all right. DNA in the chromosome carries out two functions. Reproduces itself and produces the information uh, or the RNAs for proteins. Um, so, so two very important bits um, that, RNA, uh, that DNA does for us. Now, as far as replication, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, DNA has to get replicated, but before we can replicate it, we need to separate the DNA from itself, the double helix. And that happens at a place called the replication fork. So let's take a look. So here's the replication fork right here where the two strands are unwinding. Now this is done uh, by a few different um, types of enzymes. Um, helicase is one that unwinds the helix. There's also some, when we start to unwind this, it can lead to, if you've ever had a, a tangled up uh, phone cord, one of those stretchy kind, and you start to pull on it, it gets even more wound. Um, so there's um, something called uh, topioisomerases that come in here and actually go and, and kind of cut and then remove the supercoiling that happens. Um, when this replication fork starts to open up and unwind, uh, we need something to protect those exposed nucleotides. And that's what these SSBs, these um, single strand binding proteins are. And they're just here protecting the, the DNA. Now this is DNA polymerase. And it's probably DNA polymerase three. Uh, DNA polymerase is the main replicator. It, it writes DNA. Um, it makes DNA chains. Um, but it has to read the DNA. <coughs> excuse me. It has to read the DNA from the three prime to five prime direction. So it's going to be reading this kind of green strand, so that it can make the orange strand in a five prime to three prime direction. That's the only way this thing can write DNA. The problem is that this lagging strand, this this other green strand that needs to be copied, right? It's facing the wrong direction. It's already facing the five prime to three prime direction, um, opposite, of course, of what this this green one up here was doing. And so that means it needs to be turned around um, with this weird little kind of loop so that this uh, DNA polymerase 3 can create these little orange fragments in the right direction. These little orange fragments aren't connected to each other. They're made in little chunks uh, because this, this can only make little orange fragments and then it has to go and re-loop this whole side. And so those are called Okazaki fragments. They get pasted together by something called DNA ligase. One more thing that has to happen here is that before any DNA can be made off the news uh, or, or copied, there needs to be something to add new nucleotides to. And that's where this primer right here comes in. There needs to be an RNA primer, something that bonds to the, the, the DNA being copied and allows for nucleotides to be added onto it. There needs to be something already there. Polymerase can't just create a new strand out of nothing. So that means something has to come in later and remove those RNA primers, um, something called primase, and actually go and, and repaste those in with DNA. So a lot of stuff is happening in here. So it's a compli complicated, um, complicated thing. Here's another guy, DNA gyrase, um, also involved in unwinding and opening this replication fork. Uh, the DNA polymerase has this subunit that's a, called a sliding clamp and if you look up a youtube video on it there's a really neat couple of videos that just show it's like a little machine holding um, the strands apart it's really neat um, so we get the two daughter strands and that's how dna sort of gets replicated and here we can kind of talk about some of the, the the key features so we have to open up the chromosomes first of course to get to the dna and this often in involves um, changing the the structure of those histone proteins and some of this is acetylation and deacetylation of the lysine residues um, acetylation and deacetylation you can see here is adding an acetyl group um, what this does is changes the charge and if the charge would change uh, change they no longer have that same association with the dna so it starts to let go a little bit so then we need the, the higher order wound up structures to kind of relax. And that's where those topioisomerases go and they break the DNA bonds and then just kind of like loop them over each other to, to relax them. Um, 
Kila cases also help with unwinding. We needed the primers. Primers are there so that there's something to add new, new nucleotides to. And D DNA polymerase is the one that does that. Now, DNA polymerase is also pretty good at checking for mistakes. It can actually look back on DNA that it just made and see if it put in the wrong base pair. Because um, again, every time it sees an A, it's going to put in a T. Every time it sees a G, it's going to put in a C. It's going to put the opposite of the nucleotide, the one that it pairs with. Um, and then again, on the lagging strand, those get synthesized in chunks called Okazaki fragments that later get pasted together by ligase. Um, sometimes we want to amplify DNA. Let's say that we want to see if you carry a particular gene, maybe a gene that could be a marker for a cancer, or let's say that you might be, uh, you know, let's say that it was two months ago and you might have been infected by coronavirus. So we need to know what kind of gene we're looking for. So this is where sequencing comes in. Um, let's say that we know the gene sequence of a cancer gene and we also know the gene sequence of the coronavirus, which we do. Um, we want to look to see if you have coronavirus DNA in your body. We want to see if the genes from the coronavirus are there in your body. So what we do is we take a swab, we get your DNA, but now we have to amplify it. Um, we want to make millions and millions of copies so that we can actually see it and tell if it's there. Uh, but we don't care about all the DNA. We just want to amplify the gene in question in case, you know, we want, you know, in case it's actually there. So what we do is we make some primers, just like in DNA replication. We need some primers that are going to go and actually bind to the gene that we're interested in copying. So it'll, it'll, it'll just be like the first, you know, 12 to 16 digits in that sequence. And this will go and it'll bind to it. Um, and sort of like this. So let's say that this is the DNA in your body. And we've made the primers, and so they've targeted those those things. That, um, uh, so we've made the primers, and there's a primer for this little section, and a primer for this little section, right? Because we, we want both sides of this, because this side is protected by by a template, and then this side is the template for the real side. So we we want both of these parts of the gene. And then we take advantage of DNA polymerases from organisms that live in really hot temperatures, because what we figured out was if you heat this up. Remember, the hydrogen bonds are weak um, and high temp. We heat this up to 95 degrees, the DNA separates. These the two strands right here separate. And then we add our primers, we add lots of nucleotides, and we add a polymerase, one that can function at high temperature. This is why we need to get it from an organism that lives in like hot springs. In our bodies, at high temp, our polymerase stops working because it denatures. We're, we don't have the me mechanisms for working in high temp. So we stole this from an organism that lives um, in, a hot, in a hot spring. It's called TAC. So this is TAC polymerase. So once we've heated this up, we add the primers, we add the DNA, the, the, the A's and the T's and the C's and the G's, and we just, let, we just let nature happen. DNA polymerase goes in here and it actually copies um, each one of our original strands. So now we have twice as much DNA as we started with. We had one set, now we have two sets. And then we do it over and over and over. And you only have to do it, you know, 14, 15 times to have a million copies of that DNA. And it only copies the DNA that we're looking at. So by the end of, let's say, even three cycles, we have eight DNA molecules, but on top of that, we have some that are just purely the gene. There are some that have some extra bits, and that happens because of you know the way that we copied. But we, we will keep doing this until essentially we have only the purified gene. And so this is how we can, um, again, inc de detect if you've got a, a bad gene. This is how we can detect if um, a virus gene is in your body. This takes a little bit of time, you can imagine. Um, so again, after about 25 cycles, 33 million copies of that DNA can be made. Okay, sorry. As far as repairing DNA goes, um, it can be damaged by a few different things. Mutations, of course, happen. Uh, mutations can be anything from um, natural radiation. We saw some of that in the early chapters of this book. Um, it could be um, carcinogens. These are chemicals that cause cancer. Um, they, they, they cause cancer because they mutate your DNA. It could be light, ultraviolet light, we know, that can cause um, something called uh, thymine dimers between neighboring um, T's. So instead of these guys, you know, being in a DNA strand, instead of hydrogen bonding to the A, 
they won't because they're busy doing something called a dimer. And so that leads to um, when, when DNA polymerase tries to come in here and, and write a new strand and copy this, it can't. And so that's, that's damage to your DNA. Um, mutations can also be um, having the wrong base pair copied in. It's supposed to be a C, let's say, but instead uh, an A gets put in. You know, this can lead to, and we'll see in the next chapter, um, uh, differences in the protein. Um, but errors can be fixed, and some, sometimes uh, DNA polymerase goes and just recognizes the mistake, cuts it out, pastes in the new, um, the new, uh, uh, the new nucleotide, the correct one. Sometimes, um, you know, if, if external damage happens, then again, we have enzymes that go and they recognize um, irregularities in the structure. Usually these DNA damaged um, parts are bulges or they have something wrong with them that the cell can recognize. And then uh, base excision repair, it cuts out the wrong bases, puts in the right bases. So um, that's one of the ways or a few of the ways. And, and this is kind of how it works. DNA glycolase, glycolase, glycolase recognizes the damaged base. It catalyzes the hydrolysis of the glycosidic bond between the base and the deoxyribose. So it cuts out. So if you got your, your phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar backbone, right? And here's all the nucleotides. Let's say this one was the bad one. It just cuts it out so that it's gone, leaving the backbone still. Then something else has to come in here and remove little bits of the backbone uh, because with, without you know getting rid of the backbone, we don't have something that can just stick new bases on. We have to put the whole thing in. So we have to cut out the sugar phosphate. Um, and then the next step, DNA polymerase, which already does this job by, you know, this is its normal job to put in base pairs, uh, comes in and adds the new base pairs. Um, and then the, the, the end, the, the last, you know, the, the spot where it's, let's say where the mistake was, um, let's say that this is the good strand and let's say that it just fixed this and put this in. Now it needs to join this together. Um, ligase seals the joint. So uh, base excision repair. All right, so that essentially wraps up chapter 25. I'm gonna get chapter 26 up for you guys too because it, it goes in really well with this. So this is like a part one, we'll do a part two.